Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as as the Bard of Philbar. Welcome to session Fartuk-27. Last time, the group penetrated deeper into Fitz Keep and found danger lurking in the chapel. A flame skull unleashed a flurry of damage to most of the party while damaging the building itself as well. Clever deception and a coordinated attack allowed the party to sneak past another deadly encounter. With everyone nicked up, the group opted to fortify their position and rest for a few hours, and then determine a course of action. We rejoin them as they leave the chapel to continue around the U-shaped keep. Hey! A staircase! Up! Let's see if we can, said Fargus, but stopped when a lady Arena raised her hand. A few tense moments followed, and the ranger looked annoyed at the delay. I heard a voice, whispered the elf. Cabe, nodding, confirmed her account and pointed out an exit to the courtyard. Sister Elaine shrugged her shoulders and Welby darted past the elves and into the open courtyard, yelling, Hello! Hello! until he was taken to the ground by the cleric who wrapped her hand over his mouth. You have no idea if this is a friend or a foe out here, jackass. Use your head, she angrily told him as she released the clinch on his mouth. The rest of the group piled into the courtyard with their weapons drawn, but found no one outside. Actively scanning the grounds, noting nothing moved and no sounds were heard. Well, I thought I heard a voice, stated Lady Irena. I guess I was wrong. Cabe corrected her and pointed out that he too had heard a voice. Fargus began to bicker with them about hearing things in a haunted castle, but stopped when they noticed Sister Elaine speechless with her mouth hanging wide open. Hey everyone, said Welby O'Toole, look, two moons. Following the pointing finger of the rogue, the threesome looked up to the sky and observed a pair of large, bright moons. Initially stunned, the group started to notice that the moons had a dark brown center and would occasionally blink out. Slowly it began to dawn on them what they were witnessing. That's no moon, muttered Sister Elaine. That is a gypsy. Reality set in on the PCs and they realized that Lady Zamora had returned to the room and discovered the group missing. She had yelled for the adventurers, which was heard by the fine elven ears, but turned her gaze upon the mysterious globe. Spotting the PCs in the courtyard, she yelled out, what are you doing in there? The sound was intensified inside the globe, and the group dropped to their knees, covering their ears in pain. Realizing the damage she was doing, she stopped and waited for the party to rise to their feet before speaking again in a barely audible tone where she was. Even her whisper was loud, and the group was astonished as she sounded like the roar of the ocean. A blast of questions exited Zamora's mouth, and the party attempted to explain. Seeing their animated expressions, she realized that they were speaking, but she could not hear them. Waving her hand in front of the globe caused total darkness inside, with only a small orb of light from Fargus's torch. Zamora spoke to the group again. I cannot hear you, she whispered. I assume you triggered the magic and got moved into the globe. I am glad to see that you are all alive. You probably went out, but there is some bad news. I do not possess the magic to aid you. What the hell does she mean she doesn't possess? How the hell are we supposed to get out of this blasted globe? Cried Fargus. He quieted down as the others hushed him. Zamora continued to speak with the group. Her hushed tone softened and continued to explain that she did not possess the magic to aid their escape, but it is hidden within Fitz Keep according to legend. Zamora explained that a piece of jewelry, Trayvon's ring, was lost within the globe at the time Fitz Keep was captured. Zamora told the PCs to seek out the ring and that would aid their escape and she could have helped them. 
The group attempted to yell out questions about the item before realizing they could not be heard. Zamora's eyes scanned the globe and stopped near the high right side of the bastion. I see something on the ramparts to your left. There is a small outcropping. Get to the second floor and find the ring. Then and only then will I be able to help you escape the globe. The group considered their options and realized they had none. They waved to Zamora and trudged back in to locate a passage upstairs. I think that staircase I found earlier is our best bet, quipped Fargus Stoutheart. Here it is. Get ready, and he drew his weapon. With the torchlight flickering against the stone walls, the group came to a dead end, twelve feet high. Puzzled, Cabe came from the back of the group and asked what the holdup was. The ranger felt the stone and did not understand why anyone would build a staircase to nowhere. He called for Welby, who snaked his way through the legs of the party and met up with Fargus. A strange salute was given, and after the situation was explained, he began to examine the wall. The rogue quickly discovered a secret catch on the floor. Pushing a loose stone in, a secret door grinded open to reveal another room. Illuminated by Fargus's torch, the group made their way into an opulent chamber. Filled with expensive furnishings, the group surmised that the room had belonged to the Lord of Fitzkeep. Old personal belongings and ceremonial armor were scattered about the room, along with a large bed and an even larger desk. The floor is etched with a general map view, probably of where Keep Fritz Keep resided outside the globe. Cabe and Welby searched a large armoire and noted the musty clothes were probably in fashion at the time, but were now horribly dated. Cabe began to close the doors when the halfling stopped him. Waving his finger in front of the bard's face, he shook his head. We have not yet searched everything, my friend. Wilby then kicked out the bottom of the wardrobe, exposing a hidden compartment and waving to it. The rest of the group wandered over to see what the ruckus was from. The rogue withdrew a small brass box with an ornamental lock on it. A smile crossed his face and he began to shake the box violently. Hearing the breaking of glass inside, his smile quickly dissipated as he realized he may have broken something potentially valuable. Well done, you ass, chided Sister Elaine. The halfling apologized and popped the lock on the box. As he opened it, a large puff of black smoke exited the box and the group leaned in to find three shattered glass bottles at the bottom. Uh, guys? said a concerned Fargus. The group turned to the ranger who pointed behind them. The black smoke was swirling and split off into three distinct sections. The swirling stopped and three columns of black smoke lingered in front of the party. Without warning, portions of the smoke parted and faces appeared in the columns along with arms that began to reach out at them. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.